Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the cave. If this is your first time finding me, I do a lot of giveaways. All you have to do to win is comment on this video and subscribe to the channel. All right, I've given you enough time. It's been a few days now. We're here to talk about us. This is the complete spoiler, breakdown, theories, anything you want to talk about. We're going to get right to it. For those unaware, typically on this channel, I dissect hip hop albums, but sometimes the movie is just so good, I have no choice but to dive in, dissect, uh, check out Easter eggs, or try to break things down that maybe you may not have seen. We're just gonna dive right into this one. Okay, so the movie opens with a text card telling us that there are thousands of miles of tunnels, unused subway systems, service tunnels, and mine shafts with no known purpose. So the first image we see is the main character, Addie, watching TV as a young girl in 1986. She's watching the Channel 11 News. This is the first of many references to the number 11 throughout this movie. I'll definitely come back to this several times. There are some Easter eggs here, which if you pay close attention, it'll give you what the movie's all about. Uh, if you check the VHS tapes, you'll see Chud, which is a 1984 movie about an underground creatures who abduct people from the surface. They literally come from underground, come through the sewer, and they take people from the surface. I mean, the relevance to that one should be pretty obvious. Uh, there is also a tape of The Goonies, which was released in 1985. This film follows a group of children in their search for a pirate's treasure in an underground cavern, uh, just as the mother must venture underground to find her abducted son later on in the movie, but we'll get to that. The last tape that I could make out was The Right Stuff, which was released in 1983. I don't think this mirrors us in any way, but it is a non-fiction movie about the development of a space program. What's funny is just days before watching Us, I watched Captain Marvel, which also had a setting in the mid-90s inside of a blockbuster video. This also had a VHS tape copy of The Right Stuff. For Captain Marvel, it made sense, as it was more about space travel, but that's a whole nother video. Uh, the news on the TV goes to a commercial, and she watches an ad for Hands Across America. Okay, for those unaware, Hands Across America was a charity event that took place in 1986. Participants would donate $10 to reserve their spot as Americans lined up to join hands for 15 minutes, theoretically creating a chain from coast to coast across the mainland in the United States with the goal to raise awareness and to help combat hunger for homelessness. It's 1986, we see a lot of early 80s movies which basically detail how this movie is going to go. Um, you got to be like a serious, serious movie nerd to really pick up on all of that on first viewing or even the second viewing. But oh, and I, I don't know how I forgot to mention it, but all of this is happening with the backdrop of several caged rabbits. We'll talk a lot more about the rabbits as the video goes on. Okay, fast forward to the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk with her parents as a little girl. Addie is wearing a Hands Across America shirt and it becomes one of her last solid memories of the real world. All right, so back to the fun on the beachfront. So it's like a Coney Island type of situation. This would actually be another reference to the number 11 as young Addie chooses number 11, which happened to be a Michael Jackson Thriller t-shirt, which he puts right on her. As they explore the boardwalk, Addie sees various activities that are significant. Before she wanders off the boardwalk, Addie sees a sign that says Jeremiah 1111. This has multiple meanings. Uh, it's often considered lucky or a magic number, but the sign specifically references Jeremiah 1111, a biblical verse that reads, Therefore thus says the Lord, Behold, I am bringing disaster upon them, and they cannot escape. They cry to me, I will not listen to them. This could be seen as a religious prediction of the bloodshed that will be brought on by the uprising of the doppelgangers or tethered, whichever one you want to call them. I think we're going to call them tethered. The last thing we see before Addie leaves the boardwalk is her dad playing rock, paper, scissors to settle a disagreement with her mom. Rock, paper, scissors actually come back later in the movie. All right, so let's get to the action. Addie walks off the boardwalk and goes from bright lights to a dark beach. The maze that Addie finds and goes to off the beach is called Shaman's Vision Quest. The tagline is find yourself and Addie literally does find another version of herself in that maze. This could be a crazy theory I tie in later, but I find it weird that it starts raining as soon as she walks into the mirror house. I thought that was kind of wild, but whatever. I'll get to all conspiracies at the end. So she wanders through a mirror maze, and the mirrors are another huge part of this movie as the tethered or the doppelgangers or the twins, whatever you want to call it. They are mirror images of the humans. I mean, she goes through one part of the forest where she sees these distorted mirrors, sees several reflection, and all you can see is a green exit sign. I've never seen a green exit sign before. I thought they like have to be red, but I don't know if that, if you know something about that, please let me know in the comments. But there's a green exit sign reflected hundreds of times on each mirror. So although there appears to be many exits in reality, she has no way out. This is the moment that she hears the tethered version of herself whistling. 
At this point, the audience is to believe the girl made it out safely, but has since suffered from PTSD from that night. Uh, this included her not speaking for a time. Fast forward to present day. I know that's a lot of fast forward, but hey. Addie's grown up. She has gotten married. She's got two children. Zora is a teenage daughter, and Jason is her son. Major theories for these two, but I'll get to later on. But for now, I'll just say that Zora is an average teen in 2019. She'd rather stay at her phone than basically do anything else. Uh, Jason is interested in magic tricks and he has a lot of strange things about him, but we'll get to that later on as well. Gabe is Addie's husband, who is a stereotypical corny dad and dabs and dances and embarrasses his kids with dad jokes. He's really cheesy. But for those who somehow wouldn't know this, yes, uh, both Winston Duke and Lupita Nyong'o were both in the Black Panther just last year. So that's cool. But let's keep it moving. So at this vacation beach house where they're staying, there are several clues. I mean, there's a shot of a spider crawling on a table under a toy spider and an early clue that the real Addy is crawling beneath and it's the fake one that's on top of the surface. So this imagery also connects with the song The Itsy Bitsy Spider, which is whistled by the tethered Addy when her family arrives in the driveway. So it's in that moment that she expresses that she doesn't want to go to the Santa Cruz beach, uh, not because she was traumatized there as a child, but because she knows that the close proximity to the tunnel. She knows. Jason, who coincidentally is named Jason and wears a mask the entire movie, is definitely going to be a future serial killer. But he's playing around in the beach house. He uses a toy ambulance to prop a door open. This is the first of many references to the ambulance truck, but in this moment, Zora knocks the truck out of the door, locking him inside of the closet. It's funny inside this closet, if you look close enough, you'll see the game Guess Who. Uh, Guess Who was literally a game where you had to match identical faces. It's basically like memory, but with faces. Is it me? Is it you? Who knows? Yes, Your person wear a hat? No. Does your person but obviously a part of Jason has a passion for magic tricks, monsters, he loves scaring people, and he's been trying to figure out this magic trick for like the first half of the movie, but we'll get to that. It's in this moment Addie finds a stuffed animal rabbit that she reacts to but doesn't really elaborate. The family loads up against Addie's wishes and hits the beach. Zora mentioned something about how she thinks the government is putting fluoride in the water so that they could control us all. That could be considered a slight nod to the fact that they could very well be controlled by those living underground and that may have been a government experiment as well. As they arrive to the beach there is a dead body being wheeled onto another ambulance but it's the guy that was holding the Jeremiah 1111 sign from Addie's memories. Notice the long shadows of the family as it's like they're connected to their feet. That's crazy because you, you gotta think it's like a, a darker version of them is connected. It's dope imagery for real. Fast forward, Gabe's friend Josh bickers with his wife just as Addie's parents did on the boardwalk all those years ago. By the way, they have twin daughters, which yes, is another example of mirrors. They even have a moment where they say the exact same thing at the exact same time and they do the jinx and the double jinx and well, just like the 11-11 references. Maybe you'll notice it on the second time you watch it, but one of the girls actually does cartwheels. It's kind of crazy when you notice it the second time around. So Jason wanders off to go to the bathroom and he sees the guy posing. I mean, either that or he's the first of the tethered to come to the surface. Addie freaks out when he's gone because she knows about the underground society and she's afraid that Jason could be abducted. When they get home that evening, Gabe is watching the Giants game and if you listen to the audio in the background, you'll hear the score is tied 11-11. Shortly after, when they tell their son to go to bed, the clock reads 11-11 p.m. Addie gets worried when she realizes that he's drawn a picture of the guy that was posing on the beach because she possibly realizes what this is. In the bedroom, she stares into her reflection in the window as she expresses her concerns to Gabe. She tells him it feels like a black cloud is hanging over her. She feels a storm is coming. Very similar to how it started raining when Addie entered the mirror maze all those years ago. So by this point, I'm convinced that the Itsy Bitsy Spider Theory is confirmed. I mean, so the exact three things that happen in the House of Mirrors is beginning to happen in the vacation house. Number one, the power goes out. Number two, all the exits are compromised. Number three, somebody's whistling the Itsy Bitsy Spider. Something is up with that song. Somebody break it down for me, I don't know. So this is the point where we all been waiting for it. We've all seen the trailers. We've seen the build up for this movie for months. Uh, when we first see them, they're all holding hands just like the Hands Across America commercial. They explain that they basically don't have good lives down below and that they want their time in the sun. They want to be untethered from the bodies of the original family. Each family member goes off and battles the shadow version of themselves. It sounds crazy. But the struggle between the two mothers is symbolic because Addie forces her tethered version into the glass table 
and when we see a crack, it represents the barrier between the two versions of the character being broken. It's kind of crazy. So each character is actually able to fight off the other version of them, and together they flee for Josh's family's house for help. But by the time they get there, they've already been taken over by the tethered versions of their family. I don't know about you, but this was a big reveal for me. When you go off just the trailers and you just see a few minutes of footage, you had no idea that it would be like several families that have tethered versions or doppelgangers and that that was a big shock to me so this family of protagonists not only overcame that they didn't kill everybody from the original group but they overcame their own tethered versions and now they've completely defeated this second set of tethered versions but it's, it's just hard to keep up with it's hard to describe once you see it you know what i'm saying but it's hard to describe it's while watching the news where they learn that people have been coming out of the sewers and attacking people. So the family drives away in the neighbor's new car and they eventually encounter Jason's tether versions whose name is Pluto by the way. He's actually luring them into like a gasoline trap but Jason somehow realizes a way to control him. Stick around for this theory at the end. So the way he saved his family he like controlled the guy by walking backwards which forced the tether version to walk backwards. So yes he saved his family but it kinda is what helped Red kidnap him and snatch him up and take him down into the tunnels. If you look closely, you'll get a good look at the huge group of tethered linking hands along the coast, led by the guy who was posing initially. He now has 1111 written on his forehead, which predicts more trouble, so Jason's mother goes down into the forest maze to try to rescue him. The two versions of Addy face off underground. During the final showdown, Red explains her three decade plan and how she was abducted by the mole people. She basically put together her own Hands Across America campaign. She explains that whoever created them was able to duplicate their bodies but not their souls. This is where I feel the movie showed its true colors. It actually painted the tethered murderous families in a sympathetic light. I mean, describing in detail how Addie had hot meals while she had to eat raw rabbits or how they don't appreciate their son being different. Uh, Jason wears a mask because it's fun and he likes to scare people, but Pluto covers his face to hide the scars. You know, the idea is to be happy with what you have and not lose sight of the fact that there are others less fortunate people around you. Somebody always has it worse. Yeah, that's basically what they're saying. But on to the climax. Red and Addy battle to the death as Jason watches. Ultimately, Addy kills Red and lets out some form of a yell or grunt which really blindsides Jason. Uh, this is when it's revealed that the young Addy was not only choked in the mirror house but switched. This explains why her parents couldn't get her to talk after all this happened. Before the closing credits, we get a scene in the car where Jason is looking at his mother knowing something isn't right. He really gave her like a Michelle Obama level side eye. The same way Hands Across America was organized all those years ago, the people living underground revived it in a much bigger way to bring attention to the cold sad lives that, that those born underground are subjected to. The final shot of the movie is a huge sweeping overhead shot showing the massive amount of people in red jumpsuits forming a Hands Across America chain. Uh, this is very reminiscent of the 1986 commercial that was shown to us at the very beginning of the movie. Very deep. Now let's get on to the theories. That's really what I'm here for. So I've been in several debates in the past few days regarding Jason. I'm going to lay out a few theories out there and I'm going to give you my two cents on them. Theory number one is that Jason was switched. Not switched at birth, but switched the year prior. Some of the evidence that supports this is that he kept playing with the thing which was like a lighter, but it didn't really work. And someone saying, well, in a previous year, he burned his house down and it just doesn't match up. I mean, as much as I'd like to believe this one, it doesn't match up for me. Yes, Jason liked playing with the lighter and his tethered version was severely burned. But how is it possible? I mean, I hate that the only way we saw him control the tether one was when Jason walked into the fire. That wasn't explained, but the best way I could think of to explain it was that since he and his sister were both half tethered, he could somehow control his own version. It's funny that Jason was the only member of the tethered who did not have scissors, but somehow had matches. I don't know. I mean, you know, how do you develop a habit for fire underground? I didn't understand that part, but I'm seeing several people say, oh, that Jason, he also will switch. He also will switch. I don't think so I could be wrong I just I don't think so theory number two Zora was switched I still really believe this one to be true uh, think back to when they talked about her not wanting to run track anymore that was a drastic change because she ran track for so many years and that she just didn't want to run anymore but when she's running from her tethered version she really doesn't look very athletic no disrespect she like couldn't run whatsoever she didn't look like she was an athlete in contrast her tethered version definitely could sprint her ass off and was so cocky and confident 
that she gave Zora a head start before trying to chase and kill her. I don't have an exact reason or exact explanation as to why, but I felt like why would they tie in track and field and then show her run and it's like, yeah, she ain't no track star whatsoever. She was literally running for her life and looked like out of place. Okay, so for both of these theories, yes, I know there was a part early in the movie where they said Jason was using a new language that they hadn't picked up on and I understand that. But in order for either one of them to be switched at any point in time, I think the father would know that their kid doesn't know how to speak. And I get it with the whole Jason versus Pluto thing because, you know, well, maybe he was tethered, but since the original versions got his mouth was covered or burnt up, so I don't see it that way. I think it was a big enough of a reveal that Addy was switched. You know, I think they played it well throughout. How, you know, when they were sitting talking on the beach and she just seemed awkward. She just seemed uncomfortable. She just seemed like she had anxiety about being somewhere where she had been uncomfortable in the past. I'll just say that. But please, please let me know what you think. We got to have this discussion. I've had far too many conversations about this with different people, different details. I think I got all the 1111 references. Uh, there were several of them. But let me know what you guys think in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys next time. And what did I miss in this movie? Let me know. Thanks so much. See you guys next time.